Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is a special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. We tell you how to take pro-life action this week right from your very own home. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo sits down with us to discuss a global pro-life policy the Trump administration has implemented. And Housing Secretary Ben Carson launched a program to help foster care teens secure housing. While we often focus on what lawmakers are doing on Capitol Hill when it comes to pro-life policy, you don't have to be a politician to make a difference. At EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, we want you to know there is always a way you from your own home can advance the pro-life movement. You can be involved. You're an important part of this movement. The way to do this, by following our call to action. We are always monitoring the top priority in the pro-life movement and how we together can leverage our pro-life voice to make a difference. This is how we do this with our call to action. Each and every week, if you go to ProLifeWeekly.com, we will provide a way for you to take pro-life action. Be sure to go to this website every week to see our updated call to action. Again, all you have to do is go to ProLifeWeekly.com. In 2019, the Trump administration announced they were taking action to further strengthen and implement a global pro-life policy. A week after the announcement, I sat down with Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to hear all the details. Here's our interview. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, thanks for being with us this morning. It's great to be with you. You made a big announcement last week about more strictly enforcing the expanded Mexico City policy. Can you tell us why is this policy important and why now? So, Catherine, uh, President Trump has made clear that uh, protecting the life of the unborn is an important uh, part of what this administration is working to do. Uh, one of the places that there's risk is that American taxpayer dollars, money that comes from you and from me, will be used by foreign uh, non-governmental organizations in a way that supports abortion or abortion-related services. We want to do everything we can to make sure that that does not happen. And so uh, what we announced was a way to uh, prevent there being backdoor from loopholes, from subcontracting in a way that would present the risk that there would be one more child that didn't come to life. And the second part of your announcement concerned fully enforcing the Siljander Amendment, which prohibits U.S. funds from being used to lobby for or against abortion. Can you clarify, is this the first time this law is being fully enforced? And where have you seen abuses of this law? So this is a substantial step. We want to make sure that in everything we do, in the way we contract, in the way we communicate, uh, every organization to which United States taxpayers provide funds understands their obligation, their duty to ensure uh, that there's not the promotion of abortion anywhere in the world. And the Siljander Amendment has been on the books for a long time. This administration is determined to ensure that it is fully enforced. And how are you planning to fully enforce the Siljander Amendment abroad? So there'll be lots of ways. First, uh, it's to communicate. Uh, just, just as with any enforcement mechanism, when organizations understand their obligations, most of them will comply. They'll They'll want to do so selfishly because they want to continue to receive those resources, uh, but they want to do things right, so we have to communicate the requirements that they have. The second thing is where we find an organization that's not behaving appropriately, uh, acting in a way that is inconsistent with what they've committed to, that is they'll have a contractual obligation, uh, we'll pull that money. Planned Parenthood has called the Global Protect Life policy the global gag rule. Can you clarify, Mr. Secretary, does this pro-life policy censor doctors abroad as abortion advocates claim? Not at all. Uh, every, every, we, we know the First Amendment here in the United States. We're doing nothing to deny anyone the ability to speak about a subject uh, that they deem important indeed, even if they disagree with this administration's views. Uh, what we're simply saying is that uh, the American money, American policy, is going to push back. We're going to do our level best to ensure that uh, the least amongst us, the unborn, uh, aren't, uh, with U.S. taxpayer dollars, aborted. Mm. And what role does the State Department play in upholding a pro-life agenda abroad and upholding the sanctity of life? So the Mexico City policy that was originally put in place uh, by President Reagan, uh, now several decades back, 
uh, President Trump has expanded upon. And the State Department has a real role in that. You see that in the announcement that we made. Uh, our team around the world, uh, the resources that uh, Congress provides that with monies that come from the American taxpayers, we have an obligation to ensure that it's spent in a way that cons is consistent with President Trump's objectives. We are more than halfway through President Donald Trump's first term. You've been Secretary of State for less than a year, almost one year. <laughs> How much time has had to be spent simply undoing eight years' worth of abortion extremism put into place from the Obama administration? So we did flip the switch. Mm. There's no doubt. Uh, President Trump's policies are uh, very different than the previous administration. Some of that work here at the State Department was done uh, before my time, when the administration first came into office under the guidance of uh, the Vice President and the President. Uh, but there's still more work to do. Um, I've spent a fair amount of time on it. I'll continue to ensure that we're executing President Trump's vision with respect to making sure that uh, no money that comes through the State Department is used to underwrite abortion or abortion-related services. What has President Trump said to you about upholding life abroad? Yeah, he's made it clear. That's the mission. You graduated, Mr. Secretary, first in your class at West Point Military Academy. You graduated from Harvard Law School. Yet many people paint the pro-life movement as anti-intellectual, as an issue solely of faith separated from reason. What's your response to that? Science is on the side of life. Uh, we've seen it. I think, uh, I think anyone who understands that uh, this, uh, this precious young child uh, is being killed, recognizes that the science, reason, dictate that this life must be protected. I, I, I sometimes hear those on the other side say that we're anti-science. Nothing with respect to protecting the unborn could be more untrue. Uh, common sense is with us, too. Mm. Days ago, just days ago, the New York Times said no Secretary of State in recent decades has been as open and fervent as Mr. Pompeo about discussing Christianity and foreign policy in the same breath. Mr. Secretary, how much does your Christian faith shape your day-to-day -day work here in the State Department, particularly on the issue of life? So as a Christian, it, it impacts the way I think about the world. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the policies I follow are directed by President Trump. Uh, the mission that we have is bounded by our Constitution. Uh, but it's certainly my faith, I think, with all believers, uh, believers of every faith, Christianity, Judaism, uh, Islam, um, I, I think it impacts all of the way we look. I, I talk about it because I want people to know where I'm coming from, how I, how I think about uh, ensuring that whether it's protecting the unborn or making sure that there are First Amendment protections or treating every human being regardless of their race, regardless of their gender, uh, treating every human being with the dignity they deserve by the mere fact that they're a human being. Um, that is a fundamental Christian belief and something that I think does, in fact, inform uh, the way I stare at the world. Absolutely. Thank you for your leadership, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Much. Thank you. Great to be with you, Kevin. Coming up on this special edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, Secretary Pompeo wasn't the only cabinet member to sit down with us. Housing Secretary Ben Carson tells us about his initiative that helps foster care teens and combat homelessness. Welcome back to a special edition of EWTM Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. Secretary Ben Carson of the Department of Housing and Urban Development is helping foster care teens who age out of the system to secure housing. It's all part of his Foster Youth to Independence, or FYI, initiative launched in 2019. This FYI program was created, introduced, and passed by Congress within four months' time in 2019. It quickly came together after a group of former foster kids came to meet with Secretary Carson to tell him about their high risk of homelessness. The National Center for Housing and Urban Development estimates about a quarter of teens who age out of foster care experience homelessness within four months' time. The FYI program aims to target teens before they lose housing. HUD awarded over $1.7 million in grants in 2019 and in January of 2020 awarded nearly half a million additional dollars in funding for FYI because of its quick success. I sat down with the brain surgeon turned cabinet secretary Ben Carson at the Department of Housing and Urban Development to hear exactly how this program works and why he started it. 
Secretary Ben Carson, thank you for taking the time to speak with us about the Foster Youth to Independence Initiative. My pleasure. I understand it was a conversation with former foster youth that convinced you to launch the Foster Youth to Independence Initiative. Can That's you correct. tell us about that encounter yes. and what was it that ultimately convinced you to take this on? Well, you know, these young people actually had done their homework and uh, many of them had been in the position of being homeless or new people who were homeless or on the verge of becoming homeless because, you know, foster youth programs are good programs. I'm glad we have them because who would take care of these children otherwise? But provisions really had not been made for what happens to them when they age out of foster care. And uh, anybody who has uh, children know that just because they turn 18 doesn't mean that they're ready to take care of themselves mm -hmm. or don't need some kind of support. So when they came and took the initiative really to come here and not just complain about it, but actually have some suggestions and mm -hmm. you know stories about what had happened to various people. It was very impressive. And uh, so, you know, we have some tremendous people here at HUD. Mm -hmm. We have the ugliest building, but the best people. And, you know, it really started concentrating on this and working with the, the youth. Mm -hmm. We were able to create a program and be ready to give out the first awards in four months. In four so, months, that so was my next question. How quickly did it come together? People who say that things cannot be done quickly and efficiently in government need to hear this story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can you explain, Secretary, how the FYI program works exactly? Who can apply? Yes. Uh, the um, various uh, individuals who actually need the program can work through the social services, uh, child social services divisions. Uh, who make a referral uh, and they can get up to 25 of them per year each uh, agency and they're able to then take these young people uh, who find themselves uh, either homeless or on the verge of becoming homeless provide them with the subsidies so that they can actually uh, rent a place and that it's affordable but in addition to that, have services, uh, in some cases educational services, uh, training, uh, different types of things, so that we can move them towards self-sufficiency because we don't want to just delay homelessness. We want to eliminate the possibility. According to the National Center for Housing and Child Welfare, it is estimated more than 20,000 young people age out of foster care mm -hmm. every year and approximately 25% experience homelessness within four years. That's correct. Why is this happening? Well, it's happening because a lot of these young people simply have not been prepared for life on their own. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, think about it. You know, when, when you were 19, mm -hmm. if you were just like out there, uh, where would you go? Uh, how would you support yourself? And in some cases, people say, oh, 19, I'm, I got it, I'm together. Mm. But uh, a significant number of people really are not together at that point. Can you speak more to how foster youth really are more vulnerable to homelessness? Yeah, well, recognize that the very nature of being a foster youth means that you don't have a traditional family structure. You know, a mother, father, sisters, brothers, aunts and uncles who have been supporting you throughout your whole life, uh, telling you uh, how you should get things done, uh, providing various contacts and advantages for you as you move on through life. So you're kind of out there by yourself. The FYI program is just a few months in, but what has it accomplished so far? Well, uh, you know, a significant number of young people throughout the country have already benefited. Uh, some of them have been profiled on, uh, on different programs. Um, and more importantly, it's given a lot of people hope. Mm. You know, they're, they're not quite as desperate as they see themselves, you know, moving toward the exit. And uh, they know that there's going to be some support for them. 
Have you found that there truly is bipartisan support for this initiative? Uh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm particularly interested in things uh, that are not political mm -hmm. because, you know, I, I am fearful for the future of our country, not because of China or North Korea or Russia or Iran, mm -hmm. but because of the divisiveness and the hatred that uh, we see everywhere, which is completely not necessary. Mm. And we just really need to start putting the needs of our people uh, out front, and this is a program that really demonstrates that. You've already hit on this, but can you speak further, Secretary, to the role housing plays in establishing a stable life for a human being, especially someone who has been through the foster care system mm -hmm. and hasn't had stability in his or her life? Well, you know, think about it. Uh, if, if you're out in the forest and you see a rabbit and you start chasing them, what do they do? They run back to their hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Chipmunk, they run back. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you need a place where you feel safe and where you feel secure. And uh, th think about all of those people who are homeless on the mm -hmm. street. You know, I've had an opportunity to go around the country and, and, and talk to some of those people and see them. And, and see the hollowed out look in their face and the hopelessness in their eyes. And, you know, when you don't have a place that you can call home mm -hmm. and where you can feel secure, you become extraordinarily vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens to these children who become youth uh, homeless. What do you know now about foster youth and about homelessness that you didn't when you took on the role of secretary in 2017? Well, you know, I've been very impressed uh, by the tremendous potential that exists in so many of these young people. If you just give it a chance to blossom. Mm -hmm. And what we need to recognize as a country is that this is our best resource, our people. Mm -hmm. And we need to be thinking about how we develop them, not how we just maintain them. Because as they develop, our country develops. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions facing our homeless brothers and sisters? Uh, a lot of people assume that they're shiftless, mm -hmm. uh, that they have no ambition, uh, and that's not always true. Is it true in some cases? Of course. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the majority of cases, it is not true. And given a choice of being homeless, or having a supportive system from which they can spring forward, <laughs> that's easy, that's an easy mm -hmm. choice. But it's not as easy for everybody as you would think. And you know, particularly when things are going very well in your life and, and you've had all the support you needed, sometimes it's, it's easy to look down on other people. But uh, you know, having been on both sides of the track mm -hmm. myself, you know, I realize there are a lot of people on the wrong side of the track who really are good, decent people that just uh, haven't necessarily made all the right choices or had the right opportunities. And when we can do things to provide opportunities for them, what a difference that makes. You know, particularly when you're dealing with poor people. Mm. You know, you, you think of all the things that it talks about in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, in the book of Proverbs, it says, He that oppresses the poor mm -hmm. reproacheth his maker, but he that honoreth him has mercy on the poor. Well, what does having mercy on the poor mean? It means being really compassionate. You know, some people think, oh, it's compassionate just to let these people lie here on the street and uh, with feces and urine all around and needles and danger of being harmed by other people. That's not compassionate. Mm -hmm. Compassionate is taking those individuals and finding an environment for them where they can have a clean bed, where they can have bathroom facilities, where they can get a shower, where they can get meals, and where they can get the help that will put them on the right trajectory. Secretary Ben Carson, thank you for your time today. It's been a pleasure. That does it for this special edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. We would love to hear from you. Whether you have a story idea, a comment, a question, you're a big part of this program. So let's connect online. Find us on social media, 
at EWTN Pro Life. And you can always send us an email at ProLifeWeekly at EWTN.com. Until next week, remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.